I think this is the kind of technology for which there is such enormous need that as long as the technology is made available, is made accessible, is made easy to use, is made easy to use securely, um, people will use it um, because there is such enormous need. There are billions of people who absolutely need access to economic tools today. And that is a very fundamental uh, need and in my opinion also a fundamental human right. Uh, being able to have the ability to express yourself, and money is a form of expression, and to associate with others commercially, again, that's a fundamental human right in my opinion. And um, for whatever reason, a lot of people don't have access to that. So to me, it's not about facilitating this technology. Uh, as long as this technology does what it needs to do, and it does it in a way that that people can use it and can use it effectively uh, to change their own future, uh, then you don't really need to market it or sell it or facilitate it or anything like that. We do need to preserve some of the fundamental principles. And those fundamental principles are the openness, uh, neutrality, borderless nature, censorship resistance, privacy of this platform. The Bitcoin platform as originally designed is designed to be decentralized. It's designed to not consider borders as a barrier. It's designed to be neutral. It doesn't care if the sender is male or female, Christian or Muslim, old or young, black or white, any of those things, those are irrelevant. In fact, it doesn't even know if the sender or recipient are human. It determines the validity of transactions based on completely neutral mathematical rules. In that lies freedom, uh, fundamental human liberty, in the ability to avoid discrimination by the underlying payment platform, just because it simply doesn't know how to do discrimination. If we can preserve these principles and make a system that is truly open to all, that is a universal ledger, that is a universal currency that is accessible, and it doesn't have to be just one, there can be thousands of universal currencies that are open and accessible, I think in that case people will eventually use it. Of course, as soon as this technology emerged, um, a lot of people tried to co-opt and change and mold this in order to suit their own needs and their own interests. And everybody's trying to grab a piece of the pie. You know, there's a lot of money on the table and that makes people greedy. Um, fortunately, what we've seen is the decentralization in the underlying technology actually prevents people from doing that. So it's quite resistant to that form of control or centralization that people are trying to apply. I think a lot of people are trying to build centralized business models on top of this decentralized infrastructure and eventually, hopefully, they will be replaced by better decentralized alternatives. There is a lot of opportunities to build bridges to the future, um, bridge the current systems we have with these new systems, and some of that requires centralization, at least for now. Uh, but any intermediaries who appear in this space will themselves become disrupted and disintermediated by this technology in the long run. Their business will be replaced by a protocol, just like they're replacing the businesses that came before them, or so I hope. And if it's not Bitcoin doing it, then we'll have to invent a better system that does it. Uh, decentralization is the essence of this technology, and centralized solutions really don't offer benefits. That doesn't mean you can't build a startup. Uh, it just means that your startup has to be focused on decentralization as a principle and utilize, embrace and build on that rather than trying to subvert it. So if your business is a, a business that doesn't look like a traditional business, that doesn't have a hierarchy, that doesn't have a fixed team, that doesn't have a fixed product, that instead um, builds protocols and develops collaboration between lots of different people, uh, then you have a better chance of succeeding in this new space. There are some very interesting businesses that are slightly centralized, but the vast majority of them is decentralized, and they're doing quite well. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that. 
basically the fundamental way of doing business has to be rethought with this technology because it's possible. And since it is possible, then the benefits of making a decentralized business uh, and benefits not for the business person, benefits for the customers, benefits for the citizens, benefits for the individuals, far exceed um, those of a centralized business. So in the future it will be very difficult to compete if what you build is a centralized business that's entire purpose is to enrich you and your uh, employees. Uh, that simply won't be as effective as instead building something that uh, enriches everyone, that makes everyone's life a bit better, that makes everyone's life a bit more equitable. So I strongly believe that decentralization is a century trend. It's not just Bitcoin, it's the internet, it's telecommunications, it's globalization itself. Our planet is becoming decentralized. It has been on the path of decentralization for four or five centuries now, uh, and it's accelerating. And now it's being noticed because of its acceleration. I think the notion of a physical location is becoming very much obsolete. The notion of being able to manage society is a series of fragmented jurisdictions that apply pressure on your most common geographic location or point of origin in itself is arbitrary, capricious, unfair, unjust, and on its way out. Uh, and that means that if successful, these technologies will have a far greater impact because they disconnect us from geography, and rather they free us from the constraints of geography. Um, of course, in the interim, there are jurisdictions, there are nation states, there are powerful entities, there are law laws and legal environments that companies operate in. Most of those um, are being challenged by this technology, but at the same time, they're also competing in this environment to attract these types of technologies. Part of this is what's known as jurisdiction arbitrage, the ability for companies to choose the jurisdiction that is most suitable for them. What happens when jurisdiction arbitrage becomes accessible to the vast middle class and then to everyone? What happens when everyone can behave the way a multinational corporation behaves, to pick and choose the jurisdiction of their choice, to migrate to the place of their choice, not physically, migrate as a legal entity migrate as an economic entity, even while their physical state remains in the same place. Uh, borders can keep people in fixed locations, but they find it very difficult to control financial interests, which is why we have this great disparity between the power of multinational corporations and nation states. Uh, and what these technologies do is they democratize access to these capabilities to jurisdictional arbitrage. They allow people to operate more like multinational corporations. Ironically, many of the same states that had no problem with multinational corporations avoiding taxes, playing jurisdiction arbitrage and having this immense power, are suddenly now concerned when the rest of the middle class gets to play by the same rules. It's about time we found some solutions to these problems uh, and stopped pretending they don't exist. And so these are empowering technologies that are going to force various jurisdictions to play the jurisdiction arbitrage game. If your country bans Bitcoin, it doesn't remove Bitcoin from your country. It removes your country from Bitcoin. <laughs> It removes the ability of your country to play in this new space. It punishes your own citizens, but doesn't affect anybody else. And some of those citizens, the ones who have the means, the technological literacy, the corporations, will simply leave. And they'll take the very best minds with them, the most creative ideas, and the capital, and go to a place that is more welcoming. And this was already happening because of the internet and is now being accelerated because of these new technologies. There are a number of countries that knew this already and are playing this game hard. Uh, good examples include um, Switzerland, which is working hard to attract a lot of talent in this new industry, 
and to create rules that are flexible and recognize this new technology for what it is and don't try to change it. Um, Singapore is doing the same and many other smaller nations may suddenly break out um, and try to become very attractive places for this kind of uh, technology. Uh, ultimately, this is going to lead to quite a bit of conflict. It's going to lead to quite a reaction from those jurisdictions that have become accustomed to throwing their weight around and getting their way. Uh, there are a few countries in the world that believe that their jurisdiction is the world jurisdiction. Uh, and of course, that's not true, but this technology is going to make that glaringly obvious. I think it's going to cause a lot of money to flow into this space, and I'm concerned that if too much money flows in prematurely, it's going to have a corrupting influence, and we may have to disrupt this technology with another round of technology again. One of the problems with ETFs, ETNs, and all of these other vehicles for um, participating in cryptocurrencies is that they introduce intermediaries and centralization in a system that is designed to have no intermediaries and no centralization. You don't hold Bitcoin when you hold an ETF. What you're doing is you're giving money to a fund manager to hold Bitcoin for you. How does that fund manager then decide which consensus protocols to follow, how to participate in the broader Bitcoin community? That gives them a lot more power than the average Bitcoin user through their concentration of ownership. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Unfortunately, it is a thing that is happening and will happen. And of course, eventually institutional money always was and is going to pour in to this environment. We're going to have to find a way to uh, preserve the original principles. And this is very similar to what happened with the internet. You know, at first it was an academic curiosity driven by principles and things were very decentralized. And then giant multinational corporations poured in and now we have problems with centralization of power and control in the internet and surveillance and all kinds of other uh, issues like that. So I am concerned, but I generally believe that technology has within it the seeds for the next round of disruption. So every 20 or 30 years, you have to disrupt everything all over again. That's the only thing that keeps freedom going. Blockchain is one of those things that has brought an attitude that uh, anything that can be done can be done with a blockchain and then venture capitalists will fund it. It's the magic word that rains millions on a startup. And just like any hype cycle before it, it's generated absurd applications um, where people miss the point. The vast majority of time when a company says they're using a blockchain, what they mean is a database. And what they're using a blockchain for is a database. And a blockchain is a very slow and inefficient database. The real principles are censorship resistance, neutrality, open and borderless access on a neutral peer-to-peer -peer protocol. If your project needs those capabilities, then it needs the technology that Bitcoin uses, which is not just a blockchain, but a blockchain with a consensus algorithm that is open, a peer-to-peer -peer network that is open, and cryptography to secure it all. Um, most applications don't need that. And, and the applications today of blockchain technology are limited. They're limited to areas where what you want to do is scale trust where you want to be able to have participants from different parts of the world who have never met before, to be able to trust in a neutral platform because they don't trust each other, and still be able to transact with each other. That's the application. And there are lots of applications that can be used for. Real estate, ownership of assets like cars and homes and things like that. Um, all kinds of digital assets, of course, and tokens, uh, voting. There, there's all kinds of uses where you can apply that. Um, but those are not the ones that we're seeing. Uh, many people tend to apply the thinking of the past to the new technology. This is called skeuomorphic thinking. And the end result of that is that we try to recreate the past uh, rather than truly innovate. 
it usually takes a couple of rounds of maturity of the technology before the really innovative, the things that couldn't be done before, start emerging from these um, technologies.